how do you survive like financially while being so true to your your unique individual vision and being so like you like you you just said you've got a bunch of things you're working on like as a young cartoonist how did you decide or maybe you didn't to navigate a career in this uh, I think I had a really unrealistic expectations. Like when I was a teenager, I was the first publisher that that took on my work was Antarctic Press in the '90s. Uh, not knowing that like doing Antarctic Press books at 19 was not a way to, for me to actually survive. I was a Mortat's assistant for a little while in Seattle. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and he introduced me to working in comics. This is the Ink Pulp Podcast. Hey yo! Hello, hello, hello! Welcome, welcome back to the Inkball Podcast. We are here, me, Sean, the Dumb Shark himself, Mateo, and our yes, special sir. guest today, Brandon Graham. Thank you for joining us, Brandon. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Man. Thanks a lot. And if the audience is wondering, I think Eric is is gone. I think he's left the show. What, what do you think, Mateo? Yeah. <laughs> probably probably what's because there's the fourth time in a row third time in a row uh, uh yeah it's at least the third I, I can actually tell you if you give me one second i have my my little uh let's see last week no eric july 23rd we recorded with no eric on the 18th it was no mateo so this is the third one in a row i was enjoying the only consistent one. wait what would you say brandon I was saying I enjoyed the episodes how much Eric was just like not having it. He was like, I have fun until the cameras go on and then <laughs> all the joy leaves my body. Yeah, and you can easily imagine how fun it was having before, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So I hope he's just like it's a totally different person, I guarantee you. Like, <laughs> woo, like this and then the camera turns on mm -hmm. and it's like well, you just watch the color leave his face. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. because Eric is full of joy, full of life. Yeah, normally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's his nickname when he's not on the on the show. Full of joy. It's funny because his art is so fun. Like it's not like he's drawing like dull pictures of people crying in the rain. No, not at all. Not yeah. at all. Like, I think he puts art. all the fun in his work. Yeah, and then like he's. <laughs> completely drains his whole body totally. and then it's just what what we get it's just what's left which is not just a, a hole a black hole totally. i'm thinking about that a bit lately uh, the idea of like how your idea your your when we're artists there's this version of ourselves that we put so much of our of into and put out there because in the last couple of years, I've been interacting with people less in the comic art world. And it's so like, part of me doesn't know how to engage with people if they don't care about my work. And that's always oh, really weird. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you hang out with a bunch of people and they don't read comics and they, you know, they don't care about art. And you're like, I have to operate without the main thing <laughs> I've focused my entire life on. <laughs> well, I was going to say, one of the things I did want to kind of talk about today is you're one of the, you're like Ed rest in peace ed in the way that your you are your whole life is dedicated to your craft i wouldn't say that about mateo when mateo has a minute to stop he's he doesn't draw <laughs> like he doesn't draw for oh yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> so are, are you like eric because i remember eric one of his things is that he can't like if he if he can draw for like more than a I don't know, a couple of days, he starts like going mental. Is that the same with you? Do you need, like, do you, do you need to draw constantly and constantly thinking about, you know, comics and, and what you're doing? I mean, I, in the past, yes. I, I recent, in recent years, I've been really trying to, to shift focus and be a person that can do things outside of just having my desk and eating my sketchbook all the time and just like, um, yeah, I mean, there's been a whole big shift in my life, like just going out and seeing the world and trying out new things and exercising and trying to not eat like a 15 year old. It's a you know, it's <laughs> those like, are all good <laughs> things. Those are all positive things. Yeah. What what uh what what inspired you to create this shift? I mean, a lot of it was just uh, 
you know, my current partner, just uh, Casey, how she's been like, uh, Sean, you met Casey, I think. Back and forth. Uh, just, I think online once, I think we oh. spoke online once, but briefly, yeah, um, she's like a lawyer when I met her. And now she's yeah. like, she's like this, she was raised by a Marine and just this incredibly effective person who is a really into comics and really into science fiction, all the stuff I have, but she's like really into outdoor stuff. And like, like I had all these new weird experiences since we've been together with like taught me how to like shoot guns and like took me out to the middle of the desert and, you know, it's way outside <laughs> of comic books. And that, that's been really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, there's a whole life out there. It's, but go ahead. <laughs> it's so fun to hear that the is the girlfriend that start teaching the boyfriend how to shoot guns and stuff like that. It's uh, it's pretty atypical. <laughs> yeah, it is really. Uh, I guess it's it's good to have people outside of just. I, don't know, I feel like my comic life is very small, and so I think it's yeah. really good. Yeah, I feel like there's a danger into just having your whole existence be um, like what you do. And especially if it's comics, like just living, breathing, drawing, making comics. I, I mean, I, I think you could have an incredibly prolific career. But as far as a life goes, I don't I don't know what kind of life that would be. Um, I just I have I have stuff I like to do outside of it. And I like to I like to travel, I like to live, I like to eat, right, Mateo? <laughs> oh yeah. Definitely. Definitely. I can confirm that. Especially yeah. because they share this that same interest. Yeah, so. Exactly. Oh, yeah, eating eating's great. <laughs> um, um, but it's a really great thing to say to people when because because comics take such an incredible amount of focus and so hard and so many That's the other side levels. of it. Like you can really devote your life to it and but there's an element of like, you know, you know, you're going to die someday. Go out and climb a tree. Yeah, exactly. Like live, live, go. And that, I think that'll inform you as an artist even more so to get away from it and bring that, bring that stuff back. But what we were saying something um, about how focused, yeah, just how, how your, your whole life was dedicated to your craft. You're saying you're making a shift to have some more living time. It sounds like, right? Yeah, but there's also been a shift in craft too. Like I've been trying to be more of a, like a workman cartoonist rather than like, you know, I'm taking off the beret and like nine to five and get a little bit more, which is, which oh, I think is okay. Helpful. Well, you were doing that all night thing before. I think I remember we would. Yeah, I mean, I, I woke up like yesterday now, so I can't really. <laughs> I don't know how you live like that, man. I got to get up early, live, get through yeah. the day. I get to bed early. I mean, part of it is I'm in the end of like a, 12 months in LA thing. And it's, um, it's kind of occurred to me that the city's not quite for me. And I've kind of become adjusted to being out in a much wider open desert space after a couple years in Las Vegas. Yeah. I did mm -hmm. in two more months, I get back there and I get to go wander in the desert, not have to talk to humans anymore, which will be great. <laughs> so are you going to go back to Vegas? Yeah. Nice. So you move a lot, like, because from uh, what I read, you're uh, born in Oregon, then you move, you spent your uh, formative years in Seattle, if I'm not mistaken. Sure. Yeah. And then Vegas, then LA, and then you're planning to go to Vegas. Okay, it's, it's really weird for an Italian, more, like, yeah, usually Italians. Sorry, I, I missed that. Sorry. Oh, I, I was in New York for five years, too. And then back. Ah, up. okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's been all over. <laughs> A lot of it's just like, I really like America, but it's weird here. And I'm trying to find where I fit. And, and it's been Las Vegas so far the most. Okay. Uh, I do want to check out Atlanta more. Dude, come to Atlanta. I lo I'm out singing Atlanta's praises day and night. I love living here. Nice. I was just. Have uh, you ever thought about outside the U.S.? I almost, I was debating moving to Amsterdam for a while. Mm. Gotcha. Why, why Amsterdam? It's a beautiful place. I did an art show there that was that was fantastic. Like just the experience. Nice. I, I did this. Um, you know, um, you know, we transfer that website. Yeah, yeah. Files. So their offices are in Amsterdam, and there was a guy. It's a long, elaborate story, but there was a guy that was uh, working there who I feel like I knew him through. I'm just going to sound like named. I think I knew him through William Gibson. They were friends. Okay, and I was 
friends with her daughter years ago, with his daughter years ago. And anyway, somehow I ended up doing an art show in Amsterdam and I went over there and it was just like, I was the most like King Ralph dumb American over there. I remember they were all drinking little coffees and I had like giant glasses of buttermilk. And I was like, I don't know. You guys drank this stuff here. They they drink buttermilk. They drink little bits of buttermilk and I was drinking it like it was like Kool-Aid. You know? Oh my god! <laughs> but uh, oh, by the way, what's uh, like what's buttermilk? Like I've I've heard it millions of times, but I never actually investigated on what it is. Can you explain it, Sean? Because for me, it's like sour, thick milk. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it is. That's exactly what it is. It's sour, thick milk. From what I understand, it's the milk they use to to make butter from. Um. Mm. I, I don't know much beyond that. I use it to cook with like there's like when you make like fried chicken, it's great to like use the buttermilk as your wet bath before the batter bath um, mm. and and stuff like that. But I couldn't imagine just drinking it. That sounds awful because <laughs> it is. It's super thick, like super thick, like thicker than whipping cream. It's, it's like a super- eggnog that was sour. Yeah, <laughs> with and no cinnamon, <laughs> no no delicious cinnamon flavor. It's a yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's mainly a cooking ingredient. Like you put it in pancakes, you put it in waffle mm. batter, stuff like that. But to drink it alone is that's crazy talk. <laughs> um, but Brandon, we were talking before we hit record. Uh, I I always forget to have this conversation with you. You were on. Brett Easton Ellis's podcast, which just blows my mind. And for, hold on, I got to adjust my chair. Uh, for, I, I, I'm assuming most people know who Brett Easton Ellis is, but he wrote Bonfire of the Vanities, American Psycho, and he has a, a podcast. How did you end up on his show? Uh, well, basically, he, uh, so I, I do my, my kind of day job right now is I do this comic called Moonray. I got some copies here. It's this big hardcover science fiction thing for a video game company. Right. Um, right. And that company at one point, they hired a, they hired a PR team to kind of get me on a bunch of interviews outside of comics to promote the thing. And a lot of it was like oh. things that I felt really out of my element. Like a lot of it, like they put me on a thing that was like uh, veterans talking about PTSD, which is, you know, obviously very <laughs> important, but like I was kind of out of my depth, you know? <laughs> Um, I thought you were going to say they put me on the Joe Rogan show. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But no, it was like, and you know, and it was like some like kind of thing. They they had one that was like the angry nerds or something. And that was fun, but they were like kind of just complaining about Star Wars from a very kind of culture war (laughs) point of view. And it's not kind of my my jam. If I don't like something, I don't watch it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, And uh, yeah. And, and through that, they got me onto Brett's podcast and he just really wanted to talk about kind of cancel culture, which I have a lot of strong feelings about, you know, and I've dealt with a bit in the past. Yeah. And it was an interesting thing because he didn't like, uh, I didn't, I didn't really know his stuff ahead of time. Um, okay, like I kind so of you never up. read, you never read any of his stuff before that. No, but I did like a crash course after the the interview was set up where I started listening. I went through like three of his books for audiobooks and and really enjoyed them. But it was he did the audio of his voices. So I was like for a month I like lived just like every day oh. you know, listen to to Brett read a story mm-hmm. to before I draw. And then uh and then I just showed up at his apartment and did an interview and uh and was just went there being like, Okay, um I'm just gonna dump everything, all of my messy comic book career out and, and talk to him about it. And I think it went pretty well, but it was one of those things where I just, I could palpably feel that he doesn't care or read comics. <laughs> so was like, yeah, that, right. That's why I was so surprised. Yeah. I was like, I can't see him being a comic guy. He likes easy comics. Oh, well, those are my favorites. So I like that. Yeah. But a lot of the interview is funny because a lot of the interview was like, like I have a bunch of friends in Vegas that do porn and he was very interested on who was faking being gay in gay porn. <laughs> and so I was, like, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I don't know how to tell you this, but dudes that have sex with their dudes usually aren't straight secretly. You know, maybe it happens, but I don't, I don't meet them. <laughs> Cause Brett's gay. Brett is gay. Is that right? Am I right yeah. in that? Yeah. That's what I thought. Um, so yeah, I'm, I gotta, I gotta listen to that. When was that Brandon? Uh, it was about probably about eight months ago is right when I, right soon after I came to LA. So it was kind of my big LA experience, okay. which is, 
you know, very LA. And then I've been kind of, uh, laying low away from LA. My big LA experience now is I go to, there's a nice Jewish deli I go to called Cantor's. And, uh, yeah, Golan. I know Cantor's. I haven't been there, but I know of Cantor's. Being a Jew, I know of all Jewish delis in the world. <laughs> you guys all know each other, right? <laughs> right, of course. Yeah. We, we yeah. have a secret yeah. society. <laughs> you have a tunnel from Atlanta to LA <laughs> to New York that connects all the delis. tunnels. <laughs> What did you say, Brandon? I said I knew you're responsible for the tunnels. Yeah, it's all me. It's all me. In fact, I got to. We got to end this podcast a little short today. I got to go dig. Show us your hands. <laughs> Show us your fingernails. <laughs> um, uh, Brandon, so I, I want to get into this. You sent us um, your. It's not out yet, but your latest comic which is an auto bio comic correct oh yeah it's, it's called surviving on mars and it, it comes out through a uh, publisher live in the line in september uh, well, beautiful who, who by that? the way man yeah gorgeous i, I mean love it um I'm, I'm such a huge fan but i love that you you're very much a singular voice in comics you're making comics your way and you're making great comics and breaking new ground with them so i, I love seeing that and i do have questions about like career stuff but later I want to get into this book now. So you sent it and I was reading it and I was just, I loved it, but I was really kind of sucked in by how personal it was. And I, I, your work tends to have some personal elements to it. Would you agree? Other than like uh, outside of this? Yeah. I don't, I don't have an ability to turn it off, unfortunately for, you know, for good or ill. <laughs> like I, I, uh, you know, sometimes I'll just do like, Pete, I'll be doing a science fiction comic and I'll be like, this is just my, what's going on in my life through a thin science fiction veil. Right. And so the yeah. thing is really blatant because it was just like, you know, I would be having days where I'd be like, this is what happened today. This is what I, me drawing my breakfast. And then, um, and a lot of it, uh, was just like, you know, if I had like a rough kind of experience or was going through like a bout of depression, I would put it in the diary book and kind of work it out on paper. So a lot yeah. of it is yeah. processing stuff as I'm thinking, because, I think it's just the, you know, our minds, we get so into like kind of processing feelings through art that, that sometimes I was just at the point where it's like, I'm just going to feel better if I put this on paper. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It kind of have that therapeutic, you know, uh, meaning as well. So I, oh. I totally get that. Absolutely. So when you started the diary comic, was it just something for you or did you always intend to collect it and put it out? I always, uh, initially I, I'd, I'd done diary comics a little bit before I'd published this book called Walrus years ago. That was kind of a collection of my sketchbooks and things. And I would always draw things out, but that one, I think in 2018, I'd, I had this idea. I was like, I'm going to do a diary comic every day. Um, and then kind of life got messy and in the way of that. And I, I started it and then I took a big pause and then I came back to it and it was weird to put together because it was like cobbling together this thing that was like, you know, from 2018 to now. Uh, and, and uh, cutting out things and rearranging it. And, and uh, you know, it was, it was done over the course of living in like three different cities. Mm -hmm. So and, it's, and it's, Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, it's really weird how much it changes, how something is read the way that you put stuff in it. And there's a couple things. I don't know if the version I sent you, I did a comic book about kind of the last week dealing with, with Ed Pisker before he died. And I, I, I don't know if that was in the thing. I don't I think I saw that. I don't think um, that was that one's on my I'd love to. Okay. That was, uh, that was a weird, heavy one. Cause I had this like very heavy thing about this horrible thing that happened to this, to this guy that I knew. And then just like figuring out where to put that. And luckily I had a couple things in there. Like I'd done a comic, uh, JH Williams had asked me to do a comic book about the Vegas shooting right when I was visiting there before I'd moved there. And so I had a couple really heavy comics that I kind of sandwiched in before trying to end it on some light stuff. Yeah. You're, you're always producing. Um, so I have so many questions. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where to start. Well, first off, I do, I do want to talk about craft because you're someone who, I mean, you, like I said, you, you live and breathe comics, but not just making them. You're always studying them and you're always like going to comic shops and, and finding even not even just American comics, but European and manga just out there stuff and posting about it. I mean, you've really dedicated yourself to this, this medium. And, and sorry to interject, but 
it oh, shows ahead. like in what you do like i can see clearly like a lot of european influences manga as well but the the thing that caught my eye in i immediately is this kind of it's it's your version but it's, it really reminds me of a uh, moebius here and there you know this you know especially the settings the environments this you know wide shots it's uh it's really striking and it's you know it really is really special because you know in a in a in the industry that you work in which is you know really american it's right, sure. uh it's right. it, 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 you know it's striking yeah i mean i i think i'm really one of the major things that kind of keeps me going is reading like like my job is to find things that excite me and and I feel like comics sometimes it, it's so easy to focus on the negative, you know, like there's people whose entire mm -hmm. jobs have been like, I'm going to have a YouTube channel and just complain about wonder woman comics or whatever. And right. I feel like it's so much better use of my time to just be like, what's the best stuff? Like, what can I dig around and find? Um, so, you know, I always have a stack of, <clears throat> of, of books, like, you know, even next to me here, like I'm, I'm reading Puma blues for the first time, which is fantastic. Well, I don't even know that book. Do you know that book, Matteo? No. no, no so it's no, Michael Zuli. Really. He died recently. He was he did some great Ninja Turtles books in the eighties where the turtles were like more realistic. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, wait, wait, yeah. Wait, what's his name? Uh, Zuli, Michael Zuli. Yeah, yeah. He just recently passed away, right? Yeah, and I and I had this book like in my to read pile, and I was like, time to time to move that up. So yeah, I, I always have a bunch of um, like I just read. Uh, I just read my uh, maybe my first Philip Droulet book yesterday, and I was blown oh, okay. away. I, I've always loved his art, and I was like, hey, "It's yeah. too crazy; it doesn't make sense." Because I tried to read it when I was sixteen, and I read it yesterday, and I was like, "This is awesome!" What was? <laughs> why was I not reading yeah. this? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I really try to like absorb the stuff as much as I can, and and Mobius is, you know, Mobius is hard to be a fan of and have it not infect you. You know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah he, yeah, he brings you one of that's what it, it gets back to. <laughs> I hate to stir this up again, but it gets back to um, when we were talking about people who trace versus people who don't trace. And my, my argument was when, when I pick up a comic, I like to enter a new world, a world that is that artist. And Mo Mobius is, is ex the prime example of that. When you open a Mobius book and you dive into it, that you're just, you're in a world that, only exists in his head and, and nothing else looks like it. Right. It is interesting how much reference he used. Like he was constantly looking at photo reference. Like I found a, a National Geographic issue from the early 80s, I think, and had a story on, um, on like, I think it was on microscopes or something. It just had these things of it showing like the inside of a human body, uh, you know, super zoomed in. And from that one article, Mobius had taken two pictures that he based an entire Major Gruber, like, three-page story off of. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and it's like, he didn't even do different articles. It was two photos that were next to each other. How did you How did you discover that? Was it, was it an interview you read that Mobius gave? Oh, no, I literally just had the National Geographic issue because I look at a bunch of – I have a box next to me of just old magazines for reference. So, I'm so always you saw those two photos and were like, wait a minute, that looks like – a Mobius story I read. Yeah, exactly. Because I've been looking at. And there's a couple times that I've done that because I'm so obsessive about comics. I found a Milo Minara. I found a photo that. Oh yeah. Minara based something off of two at one point, and it was just like. That's it amazing. might be a still from a movie. Maybe someone else found that, and I'm just taking credit for it. But <laughs> <laughs> when you see something, and you're like, "Hold on, I recognize that." <laughs> and I don't know why, but when I when I looked at uh, the Baster machine. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but it immediately reminded me of, I don't know if you're familiar with the, I don't know the English title, is the Garage Hermetique oh, by yeah, Boy Mobius. Because this guy has this box and it starts pulling out oh. stuff. There's a whole story attached That's... to it, but I don't know why. It immediately reminded me of the, you know, the, this garage in the, in the Moebius story when cool. stuff comes out and that's, and that's the airtight, stories, airtight garage. Is that what that is? The yeah, airtight garage. The the thing oh yeah. Airtight. Airtight is the, yeah. is the term in English. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Really? Is the, is the French basically like the perfectly sealed garage? Almost? Yeah. Perfectly sealed. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, Bastard Machine's a, a weird comic I've been working on for a couple of years. It's kind of as this, I have like four side projects that I'm always working on. And so I've got like... Jesus, you know, man. Yeah, uh, I know, just all, always producing. 
um, always producing. That one I'm, I'm excited to get back to. Um, the idea is to basically do like a Rube Goldberg comic where this guy sets up all these different um, these different things over the city, not knowing what they do, and then in issue six, not to spoil my own comic, um, they just like. <laughs> Being like, like no dark. worries we okay. have only like two or three viewers so no problem <laughs> <laughs> i was going through some of your interviews you have some great stuff like i just saw the klaus jansen one. Oh, dude that was awesome. I, oh, yeah. I was watching the mark miller one and saw the klaus jansen one and i was like oh i need to go to that one i had yeah, an that was, that was a good one i've only What's met that? i only met uh, klaus jansen once really briefly and it was when i was leaving i, I used to do porn comics and I, it was the only thing I could bring up to DC when I was visiting there. And I'd go up and see Bob Shrek there. And I <laughs> left Bob Shrek stack of comics. And I was like, you're a, you know, you can't hurt Shrek's feelings. Like, here's a stack. No, no. Go Bob's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, and then as I was leaving, he was like, oh, this is Klaus Jansen. And I was like, oh, my God, I loved your work. And then I'm walking out and I hear, come look at this guy's porn. And I was just like, don't show my porn to one of my <laughs> <laughs> Dude, one of the, one of the, like, uh, I, I, highlights of, of my life, I guess, or, or one of the most surreal aspects of my life is, you know, Klaus is with the same art dealer as us and Klaus is just a friend of ours now. And like my kids text with Klaus and my wife texts with Klaus and it's just so bizarre. Um, and I do, I do want to bring up before we hit record behind me is a blurry wall of prints and, and Brandon is such a comic file. He, Picked out right above my finger. That's a Dark Knight Returns print. I still don't know how you saw, saw that, but it, it's signed by Klaus and Frank. Oh yeah. Also, I know who you are too. So it's not. Well, that that that's a good point. You know me. You know my loves. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wanted to ask. So I, I mean, you have you have a like I said, a very unique voice in comics. And you never tried to fit in, and, and I'm saying that in a good way. Um, I've, I've bro, tried. I just think I failed miserably. <laughs> did, how did you try? How, how and when did you try to, to fit in? Profit was really me trying to do a mainstream. Oh. Um, yeah, but you I, still did it your way. Yeah. Um, yeah, it wasn't uh, – I mean, I – I, it was something I wanted to read, and, I, and it's weird because I really like, you know, I like a lot of mainstream comics, like you know, yeah, you know, I love like Alan Davis work and Frank Quietly, and all these guys are fantastic. Obviously, Frank Miller, but um, but yeah, I, I just don't, I can't really. I think my stuff gets a little weirder than theirs, or it's just coming from a bunch of different places. So I don't know but, if I could do like a a run on Aquaman. Yeah, people know, yeah, and, 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 well, I think you could probably do an awesome Aquaman that. I would love. <laughs> I don't know how the Aquaman fans would love it, but I would love it. Um, I have a Aquaman idea. <laughs> oh my god! Let's make this. Happen. They gotta put him in space. <laughs> I feel like I feel like the character is un, unfixable unless you just put him in space and have him dealing with alien alien uh, creatures that are living in space and, and alien water planets and things like that. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. See, it's, uh, now I'm yeah, interested because I have no interest in Aquaman, but now I'm interested. <laughs> um, but like. I guess it gets into some of the frustrations and struggles I'm trying to work through is like, how, how do you have, how do you survive like financially while being so true to your, your unique individual vision and being so like you, like you, you just said, you've got a bunch of things you're working on. Like as a young cartoonist, how did you decide, or maybe you didn't to navigate a career in this? Uh, I think I had a really unrealistic expectations and then I kind of went through, you know, I, uh, like when I was a teenager, I was the first publisher that, that took on my work was Antarctic press in the nineties. Uh, mm -hmm. I did, when I was 19, I did a three issue series there called Korean. And, and my idea at the time was I was like, you know, I was a big fan of like, uh, Joe White's Twilight X and Fred Perry's gold digger. And so I was like, that's a realistic place that I can, um, that I can get published by and I'll be able to live off of doing comics there, but not knowing that like, you know, doing Android press books at 19 was not a way to, for me to actually survive. And so eventually through, um, I was a more tats assistant for a little while in Seattle. And, oh, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah. And he introduced me to working in porn comics. And so I started doing stuff for NBM. And so that was my first, okay. like paying my rent off of comics was doing, uh, like inking. So you've his been doing porn. porn comics for a while. 
yeah, yeah. And at first I was really offended. I was like, how dare I'm a serious artist. I don't want to do porn. And now I'm just like, I'm just going to draw kitties all the time. It doesn't matter if someone's paying me or not. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, even your auto bio stuff is full of porn. Yeah. <laughs> no one gets out clean. <laughs> I was like a little prince when I started and it's all gone to hell. <laughs> Uh, so d- d- are, are you like, are you constantly struggling to, to make the ends meet while you're making these very singular vision artistic comics, or have you found like a, a comfortable place in a way to do this? I feel like I've figured out the hustle at this point. Um, I mean, for me, it's just, uh, I think the main thing is becoming accessibly accessible financially, if that makes sense. Like, uh, like having, knowing where you can, uh, where you can work regularly and, and get an income from it, you know, like, like I know what it pays to do an image book for me. And I know that I can like do a book there regularly and I'll get, um, this amount of money from it. And then, uh, lately for the last two years, I've been doing this Moonray book. And so that I do with a, with a page rate advance, but <clears throat> mm-hmm. you know, having things like, uh, the ability to sell your original art, excuse me. And, um, uh, and it just kind of, I guess it's kind of knowing all the different places that you can sell art and being able to, to pivot because you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket and be like, <clears throat> I'm only going to work for this company. And then they disappear on you and you've got no other options. So right. I, I'm, I'm trying different things now. Like I've been working with, um, uh, with the guys that live in the line and that's been a really fun, cool experiment because it's like a newer publisher that's trying out these different things and they're doing really like higher end printing than I've done previously. That's and like, um, I sent you guys some examples of this black and white book I'm doing, which I'm yeah, going to do. That, that was awesome. beautiful. I'm going to yeah. show you. I'm, uh, I'm drawing that one gigantic. Like these are the oh, original. Wow. Oh, wow. Shit. Um, Jesus, man. And it's basically my take on like, um, it's like my take on like a vampires kind of the universal monster style things like mummies, vampires, uh, werewolves and things, but in this far kind of vampire view future. And all the, oh, all the lettering wow. is handwritten. Yeah. I do kind of a mix now because, uh, mm-hmm. because Sean at living the line helped me make a font of, um, of my handwriting and, and of my hand lettering. So I'll do some stuff on this and then I'll fix it or rework it. Uh, yeah a font oh man nice, oh, okay. nice. Awesome, man. those are beautiful are you you're primarily using microns when you ink Brie? yeah yeah I and mean, you can see on this one i ran out of paper so i taped two 11 by 17 pieces together to do this big thing here oh my god <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta make everything that same line with um, so i'm so, that Sorry to interrupt. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll ask the question. I was saying that one's kind of an experiment. I'm always thinking of, um, you know, like Paul Pope did his book Escapo and he, he put it out with this idea almost like it was like a a musician releasing a single that could like stand on its own. And part of it for that book is I went into this great comic store called, I think it's called Nemo's just in a small town. And it was just weird and had all these comics I'd never seen anywhere before in the back issue bin. And I had this idea. I was like, I want to make a comic that feels like it's for this store. Um, mm. Yeah. So it just kind of, I think having kind of a North star of like, I want to do this and then trying to produce stuff regularly and knowing where to sell it to, and then having a bunch of different options to sell things to and, and different kind of plans years ahead that are, that you're able to kind of pivot for is kind of my, my plan to stay alive financially. Hey, it works. So, sounds like a plan, man. But uh, uh, so there's a question I want to ask you uh, earlier. So everything you do right now is still well, aside from the colors that you know it's 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 clear that they're digital. By the way, are are you doing the colors as well? So you're doing it all? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And aside from that, like all the line art, it's it's all traditional. Or you were digital digital too? Oh no, it's all traditional. I haven't I haven't quite figured out like i guess i haven't really put in the time to to draw digital i've never really like i do a lot of like corrections and things obviously in photoshop but i'm not really drawing anything any any actual you know figures and faces anywhere but on paper um yeah and, you know, one advantage of that is just selling the originals yeah yeah no absolutely it's uh, it's i always say it whenever we talk of original like it's a it's a huge component mm-hmm. uh if or for traditional artists and, and and by the way uh, 
um, surviving on Mars, the pages that we see there, they're actual like diary pages or you mounted images that you did here and there on different pieces of paper? Uh, it's, I mean, they're all, I'm going to show you here. I've got one of my sketchbooks. Um, yeah. So a lot of the pages are just, let me see if I can find an example here. Um, yeah, I'll do, I don't know if this shows up, but I'll do just a lot of sketchbook yeah. stuff no. and, and kind of cobble it together. Like some of the times I'll do panels that don't work at all. And just, I'll just rework it in Photoshop and some of the, yeah. some of the writing in there, like it's, it's, I'm kind of lucky that my general style is fairly clean now because a lot of it is just messy scribbles that I've kind of colored quickly and put in there. And you can see like, there's a lot of like erase lines and things that you can see if you look closely mm -hmm. in that book. I like that. I like to but, see it. And, 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 and speaking of, of selling original art, how about like, since this one is made on an actual diary, <laughs> would you, what, what would you do with that? Would you sell the diary? I mean, it's a bunch of, it's a bunch of sketchbooks at this point. I mean, I guess I could, I just, I, yeah. I feel like it's It'd be um, interesting to, to see it's, it, it, it would be hard to even give a, you know, a number, like a value. Dude, to, because I it's remember, basically you're selling a, an entire book. Yeah. I remember at San Diego Comic-Con, this is probably 1998, 1999, Adam Hughes, someone bought a sketchbook from him and it became a thing where collectors were trying to buy Adam's like entire sketchbooks. I don't remember the numbers, but it was a, it was a right. good chunk of change. I, guess, I think that's how Robert Crumb bought his house in France too. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, okay. of his sketchbooks. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, I can't do those sketchbooks. I mean, th those are, those are workbooks more than sketchbooks. Yeah. I wonder if you're selling those off, if you go through and you're like crossing out people's phone numbers you put in there and things like that. Right, right. <laughs> Little personal notes. <laughs> this guy's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting idea. That is, is kind of what you put in your sketchbook versus what you're comfortable with strangers seeing. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's that factor too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I was just at a uh, Jim's place and we spent, uh, the weekend just kind of working in his studio, but we did a lot of like, I guess what you guys used to do, which I found really, really helpful. Just looking at old comics and studying them and drawing from them. And, and it just, it kind of grounds you back in how much you love the medium and doing this and, and how, how much greatness has come before us. Like I, I got lost in the Mike Zek artist edition and, and I liked Mike Zek, but like looking through that now, cause I probably haven't looked at Mike Zek's in 20 years. I was just like, Whoa, uh, this guy's a master of comic, like superhero comic work and his yeah, Punisher exactly. stuff is incredible. So I was like, I got, I got to go dig back into that. But uh, Jim said, that's what you guys used to do. And, and that just gets back to the idea I was saying, like, you really, you just live and breathe comics. Yeah. Totally. It was like me and him and Stephen Green would all, uh, would all go out in the middle of Portland and just take over a corner of a, of a bar for like <laughs> six hours and go through stacks of comics and, and talk about yeah. it. It was really fun. I remember meeting the first time I met you, I was visiting Jim and we met at some coffee house and we came in, you were like on a Frank Miller tear and you had a whole bunch of shit just spread out on this coffee table. And oh, we yeah. were there for a while looking through shit and talking about it. Yeah, that's funny. I remember us doing things like at one point I remember Steven was like, like J. Scott Campbell's an interesting artist for me because I, I really like some aspects of what he, what he does and other aspects of what he does doesn't work for me. Like, like a lot of his comic stuff I find less appealing than his illustration stuff and it's not to... Yeah complain about it's just coming from a different place than i am um and and so a lot of it we're we're breaking down in sketches being like well let me try to show you what about this is so exciting to me yeah. um so we were redrawing uh it was like a bunch of us just redrawing uh, different different pinups and trying to be like this is how i do it this is how i do this stuff and it was and it was kind of like you know like a learning process yeah i love that mm. right right Sean, according to my analytics, your thumbnails are one of the highest in demand items on the internet. What have you got to say about that? Jim, funny you should say that. I have a gift for everyone in the Inkpulk community. A free PDF of some of my thumbnails, 
as Jim said, which are in high demand. Also, I'm giving you a new home, the home of craft, the official home of the Ink Pulp community, inkpulp.tv. A place where you can learn about the craft of comics, engage with the community, receive special offers, and so much more. In order to get your free PDF, head to Ink Pulp TV, sign up for the newsletter. This is just the beginning of so many wonderful things to come. Thank you. Keep craft alive. I wanted to to go back for a sec, just for a sec, unless Sean, you, you had something no, 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 specifically to ask. No, no, no. I, no, I wanted to go back for a second uh, to the, the the whole porn thing because uh, I saw on the on the diary diary comic. There's a lot of that stuff too. And and you're basically on set and you were drawing stuff as you were looking. I I, I actually went and found a couple of scenes oh, and nice. the moments that you drew, <laughs> to be honest with you. I didn't jerk off. I just yeah, you know, uh, um, I, was, no, I was just curious. No, no, yeah, was, no, not it, at all. Was, you know, I was just curious. <laughs> and uh, especially the one, the dinosaur one. Oh, I, I, I went back with it with Cody Vore. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. um, yeah so, so I, I worked on porn movies for a little while um, uh, in in Vegas. My uh, my friend Leroy Myers is a porn director, and he just kind of like invited me out to to a convention there, and we became friends and started working together. And for like a year or two, I would just fly to Vegas from Portland all the time and just work on uh, porn parodies for this company called Wood Rocket. And then I, but as a, as a, sorry to interrupt, but as a, as a writer. Yeah. Yeah. As a writer. And like, it was a bunch, we did a bunch of stuff. We, we made a science fiction pilot that was not porn, but all starred porn performers. And so mm -hmm. we did a lot of writing and we liked, um, yeah, I feel like I, I always feel like I did more, but I, I don't like, it was mostly like, I would do things like, I think I talked about like, uh, we worked on a John Wick parody, John Wink, and we were like, it was me and a bunch of porn girls that were just like seeing how far we could sh shoot dildos from crossbows, which isn't like work. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw that. I saw that on the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that. And then, uh, and then later on, I moved there and like, you know, like there's a couple, like it's a really interesting city because there's a couple porn, or sorry, there's a couple comic book artists, you know, like J.H. Williams out there. Um, yeah. And... And, but mostly, like, the people I know out there are all porn performers. So that was kind of the crew that I hung out with mostly. And got really kind of bored and used to it after a while. Like being yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Like, I'm sure at first it was, like, so strange and exciting. And then it just becomes work, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's a weird mix, too. Because there's, you know, I mean, there's types of people that just make their own drama all the time, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I feel like I've gotten, I didn't like, not until my forties that I realized like, I need to be careful who I'm around because some people are just messes and you don't want that in your life. Yeah. They spill their shit yeah. all over you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And some people are really exciting. You meet someone and you're like, Oh my God, this is like, you know, these people are a party every time. I mean, that's the interesting thing about porn formers too, is there's an element of their, of them that are professional partiers. I bet. And people that don't I manage mean, that can fall apart real quick. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. So is that I was wondering as you were talking about the fact that you're a writer, I was wondering if they never because before at least I would say 15 or 10 years ago, there used to be like stories. Like I remember like a a, a porn parody of, for example, the pirates of the Caribbean, stuff oh, yeah, like that. Yeah. And it, they're complex, like storylines. Like it's it's a fucking full movie with you know acting wait, parts with with no okay. horns for like. Right, hold on, yeah. you, so you watched the entire Pirates of the Caribbean porn movie? No, but scrolling, <laughs> I would see that if I had to scroll to the next scene, it would take a lot of minutes, like <laughs> even fifteen sometimes. I've Did you lost. lose your erection in the scrolling, Mateo? Is that what happened? <laughs> I, I, I had to go really fast. Luckily, there was a small preview yeah. uh, rectangle, so I could go get very fast when I wanted to without <laughs> losing the erection. Talking, 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 moving on. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I, I was wonder if if they had like a storyboard artist for that kind That's of porn as well. Question. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I mean, I did a couple storyboards for 
for the first one I worked on, but then I realized quickly, like, they're just kind of getting blocking down and you kind of don't really need, it's not really complicated enough to need, mm -hmm. you know, you have like two cameras that are getting everything shot. So um, there's a couple things we did where it'd be like, you know, you do like a James Bond thing where somebody's legs are just like stand in front of the camera and you do stuff like that. Yeah. But um, it didn't really require much pre-planning. And after a while I was just like, I can just, we can just do this with the camera right here in the moment and take a bunch of test shots and see what happens. And it doesn't have to be on paper. Yeah, yeah, okay, gotcha. Because <laughs> Mateo's looking for a new career. <laughs> in case, you know, yeah. in case, you know, shit hits the yeah, fan. I mean, it's... There was it's, a moment like, where, like, Pornhub was hiring, like, I think Young M.A. directed some porn movies. And, is uh, that? You know, Young Ma, Young M.A., the, the lesbian rapper. Oh, uh, no, no. Not young M.A.? Not Remy Ma. You're talking about, I don't know Young M.A. No, no, no. She's like super butch. And she did uh, she had a song called Ooh that was good. I don't know. She mm -hmm. did some stuff with Eminem. Oh, you'd like her. Oh, okay. It was yeah, all such talking about rap too, Sean. I just listened to the new Rock Him. Oh, yeah. Did you like the new Rock Him? Yeah, I'm still getting into it. It occurred to me. Me too. I've never heard Nipsey Hustle before. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever listened to it. Brandon, yeah. do yourself a favor and and listen to uh nipsey's um album the grind date um I, I i it's one of the best ever ever made and it will it will it will introduce you to him and, and um and, and his his whole library of music but he only did one studio record and and uh, i'm butchering the title but okay. um it's so, so good it's so good it's such a good Angeles. for some What's reason Los Angeles in LA you, yeah, this is it's like you're only allowed to do murals of four people. It's like you can do Kobe, yeah. you can do, um, <laughs> Dude. uh, you can do uh, Snoop Dogg, yeah, uh, Frida Kahlo, or Nipsey Hussle. <laughs> and every mural, Dude, I'm in Atlanta, every mural is Andre 3000. Sometimes you get the full outcast unit, uh, you get some Jermaine Dupree murals, Ludacris, yeah. and and it's that's pretty much every mural in Atlanta. So, that's that's pretty good though. There there is one Mac Miller mural here. Oh, that's cool. But I yeah, like he's another guy I really investigated. Yeah, he's worth a deep dive on. It's 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 a shame he passed so early. He was about to do some really innovative music. Not that he didn't before, but I could just see him like breaking down some serious walls. But not to drag us too far away from comics. Here. Yeah. No, I mean I could, oh. you and you and I could go down a hip hop wormhole. We know this. Sure. To reconnect with <laughs> comics, when you said Rakim, isn't the one like didn't uh, Mike Del Mundo need a statue like a, a Mike a big did one, yeah he did one with Sanford, they did uh, Rakim, and then Sanford did Nas, and I think Raekwon. Sanford's involved with this company that does all these statues, and then he gets like other artists to collab with him. But what I know Mike. Statue? What's that? What do they do with the statues? They're like little vinyls. They're vinyl statues that you can buy. Huh. They're beautiful. Oh, like the Rakim one, I remember it specifically. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh. Mike, Mike is a fucking monster Jesus. talent. That, that I, guy I was looking is... at his covers on Instagram. Like sometimes he posts it frustrates like 10, the hell out of me. 10 pictures with the 10 different yeah. covers yeah. over the last year. Oh, yeah. The ideas, like this guy That's is a, a well yeah. of ideas, of great yeah, ideas. Like, he is an incredible draftsman, painter, artist, all of the above. But what makes him the best of the best is his brain, his uh, the, yeah. the concepts behind every cover, behind everything he fucking draws. It's insane that he's operating on levels. I, I just feel like a dumb dumb when I look at his work. Uh, yeah, covers oh, are yeah, like yeah. part of your brain almost. Like I've been really into Jay Lee's covers recently. Like I pick previews every month just oh, yeah. to see like like Dynamite has him do like he'll just do like a Darkwing Duck cover. Like, why is that that's too beautiful for Darkwing Duck? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'd like to do a Darkwing Duck cover. Sure. Um but but yeah, um no, yeah, Mike, it's it's the concepts. It's the like he figures out a, like, like what, like you're looking at one thing, but at the same time you're looking at an, an, another idea all at once, and and it's it's frustrating how good he is. But I love that I love that kid too. Um, we should actually have him on. I could get Mike on. Yeah, uh, um, at least we'll have one Filipino on. Is he Filipino by the way? Yeah, 
Uh, oh, okay. Mike, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I dodged that bullet. Oh my god. <laughs> well, we can, we can, yeah. I mean, we could just have we have Francis, we have Mike, and 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 a few other people. We could just have fill in for Eric every 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 week, and we'll have a, a Filipino on board. Maybe with AI, you could just get Eric's face on other people, and they could just play him. <laughs> well, okay. So, so this this episode's going to be coming out. Close to New York Comic Con, I think. So if you're listening, if you remember the last time Eric disappeared, we made a graphic that said, have you seen him? And Brandon, you, you might know that. Do you know skateboarding, Brandon? A little bit. Okay. So when I was a kid, Pal Peralta put out a video called The Search for Animal Chin. Sure. Do you know that one? Okay. So the 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 poster for the video was um this asian like asian guy in, in like a like a rice field hat mm -hmm. and uh, and it said have you seen him and it was just the, the this it was a skate video but the story was they were looking for the legend of this this great soul named animal chin right. um, and that was him so we we took uh jamie our, our beloved editor took that poster and put eric's face on it so nice. I, I just, Jamie just sent me the file. I am printing out giveaway stickers of this <laughs> for New York Comic Con. So come Sean, see Mateo I think and I. <laughs> you and I both, we should have, we should wear at least one day a black t-shirt with that image. <laughs> remember the death of Superman do it. bands? Yeah, I can oh, make yeah. it. What did what, you say, Brandon? It, the Death of Superman came with armbands, so like a black band that had like the Superman logo on it. I, oh my Dude, god, I don't remember like that. Chinese face on it with the black armband. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it. It came out in those like black bags. Mm -hmm. You couldn't even open it. I remember that. Do you guys know about Death of Power? No, what's that? No. So this, this guy out of San Francisco. I don't know if I can open this on the thing, but it's this guy at a San Francisco named, um, I just want to get his name correctly. Uh, where is it? He just sent me some other stuff here too. Oh, Kirk, Kirk Bidirk, or Kirk Bidick is, is I, <laughs> Bidick. anyway, he's doing his own version of the death of Superman that is like so much more violent and sexual than the actual thing. <laughs> it's almost like really <laughs> nice thick paper and it's all this oh like, yeah that looks nice yeah it's beautiful stuff but i gotta be careful what to show because it's just like like people are ripping out each other's assholes and then like <laughs> it's got, it's got like lois lane blowing lex luther and Jesus, those pages are thick like i can see from yeah. the way you're you're going through them <laughs> yeah um and he's got five books of this out now he what how many yeah, there's five issues of this now so the fight just goes on and on and on. Oh, the fight is just the first issue, and then it's the aftermath and what happens, oh, like when okay. like Lex Luthor comes to power, and like what happens to Wonder Woman and all this stuff. It's really it's it's like it's like if the most beautiful art in the world had like uh, a bunch of stoned fifteen year olds are just like, wouldn't this be fucked up if this happened? And I mean that in a <laughs> crazy like how there's a scene where it's just like like i was at first i was like this is a little juvenile and then there's this scene where the only time the flash shows up is he's just jerking off in a turtle and he's like it's so slow it's like that's <laughs> <laughs> but by the way are the characters named like superman and wonder woman or no, no, they're all they changed them but yeah because like superman his shirt on here, it's just like a triangle. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so it's it's kind okay. of it's pretty obvious. Like here's here's Lois Lane yeah. and um, right, yeah, yeah. Jimmy. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's where, that's a crazy book that's coming out. Now. Where did you get that one? Oh, he, the artist of it showed up at a signing I did in Mission Comics in San Francisco. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, and I I'd already followed him on Instagram because I just thought his illustrations were great. I didn't know he was making this insane comic. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> I, I love this, like, but like there's this real resurgence of an underground happening now. And, and I, I love seeing that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, uh, the artist, uh, is it Matty Keen? I think his name is who did like the bootleg Spider-Man. Like that's another yeah. Really yeah. That guy's amazing. Yeah. We, uh, Jim, he came by at heroes con. Jim had already had one of them, I think, but he came by, dropped some off for me and for Jim. 
And as, as you know, Brandon, on our live show, we talk about that a lot. Cause it's mm-hmm. Mateo, you got to see this. He did a, a, like, like basically what Brandon was just showing with Superman, but this kid did like a Spider-Man thing where like Mary mm-hmm. Jane is like 400 pounds. <laughs> like she's huge. It's, it's full of sex, like Spider-Man's coming webs. And it, it's, it's, it's wild. It's wild. Still on a comic book format, right? Yeah, yeah, total comic book okay. format. He pr- and he printed it on uh, on like it, it looks like old comic books. Like it's like a Manila paper yeah. and it's like a newsprint. Mm. And of course, it's approved by Marvel, right? Of course, yeah, of course. endorsed. Do you guys remember the Marvel Benefit book that came out in the nineties? Which How one was that? that? I might butcher this story. It was a it, basically Marvel was going through. Uh, if I remember right, Marvel was going through a bankruptcy and a bunch of, and a bunch of indie card cartoonists got together and they make like this kind of joke book that was like, here's a benefit book to help out Marvel comics. And I remember it had, uh, James Kachalka did Hulk versus the rain in it. And it's Hulk getting really mad. Yes. At- yes. It. That sounds familiar. Yes. Yeah. And I think that one actually ended up in a, in a Marvel comic. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That sounds familiar. I'd love to see that. You don't have that, I guess. Uh, no, I wish, um, yeah, I, it, it, yeah, I have a, I have a really positive feeling, as you mentioned, about where comics are at right now, because I feel like you guys have been doing this great, like pushing of the craft on here, and yeah. um, you know, I do a lot of videos, the Living the Lion guys, and just I, I was going through the recent previous catalog, and I've been feeling like there's this kind of indie resurgence where a bunch of stuff is getting really yeah. like interesting right now again in like the smaller. I agree. And a lot of the bigger companies are still a little stagnant and need to catch up, but I think it's only a matter of time before they kind of catch on that, like, people want things to be fun again. Yeah, I think you're, yeah. you're absolutely right about that. I think, I think what we're going through a time where, like, there's, there's a whole school of artists around our age and, and some of us who were, like, freelancers, like, we wanted to go work for these companies and have this fun job of drawing these childhood heroes. And at some point, the the oh, a lot of things happened. They just became not fun. The stories were no longer fun to read. The scripts sure. were no longer fun to draw. And and a lot of us were kind of like, <clears throat> uh, I, I'll just speak for me. I'm not going to speak for anyone else. I, I just reached a point where it just became a really difficult job where the scripts were so messy, so uninteresting. I couldn't like – put my best work into it because it was so it was such a daunting task and i just it just became like so deadline driven and 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 i i know for like like friends of mine like they're, they're going through the same thing and and we all then COVID hit and it was like okay let me i i need to get back to my love of why i do this what i'm doing and forge a path forward so i think a lot of us started building things uh in order to allow us to self-publish and, and, and produce. And I think right now that's starting to catch. And I think the young, young, young generation of cartoonists are really inspired by that. And, and I'm seeing that at shows from, from kids I'm meeting and from the, sh- like the podcast and the live show, the interaction we're getting. I mean, Jim and I did a, la- a live show a couple Sundays. Uh, no, no, it was before the Sunday. It was a couple Wednesdays ago. And Jim has a P.O. box that he says, send in all your comics and we'll put them on, on the show. And we got a stack, like a, a large, like a pretty sizable stack of books. Nice. And I'd say that the majority of them were were well done and, and really fun and like kind of mind blowing how good they were. So, I, I mean, I, like Ramon right now, I mean, by the time this comes out, the Kickstarter will be over, but he's launching a magazine called Blitz. Have you heard of this, Brandon? Oh, yeah. It just spoke to me about it. It just it just sent me an email like yesterday. I'm really and curious ask, about it. Yeah. So Blitz, Brandon, have you heard about this? Yeah. Jim did the cover for the first one, right? Right. Exactly. So Ramon, like we had the, the podcast with Nick Patera where Nick was talking about how all of us are building these little cottage industries of our own. And how we can use, like, help each other with, like, if I have a news a, a newsletter email list and you do and Mateo does. And whenever one of us puts something out, we help lift each other up and we can really build our own industry. So Ramon, upon hearing that, started thinking about what he could produce that would put everyone together. 
to to help lift up. And so he's created this magazine called Blitz, kind of inspired by Wizard in the sense that it's about comics, it's about the craft of comics, but what it's not about is the big publishers. It's about the indie creators. Sure. So Jim, you know, you get Jim to do a cover. I'm doing an ink pulp instruction installment on every issue where there'll be like a lesson I'm putting in there and there's going to be a focus on a creator in each issue. Mateo, did he ask you to be a part of it? Is that what the email yeah. was? Yeah, yeah. He asked me to do a cover and uh, and to be on on one of the issues promoting, you know, talking about myself and also promoting the my, the my my personal, you know, my own Perfect. book. Perfect. when it will come out. So, it's And it's Ramon's great. plan is this will be a free magazine that Diamond will distribute to retailers. Cool. So that when you go get your comics, you'll get a free copy of Blitz. So he's developed a, a Kickstarter that's going on right now, and it, he's surpassed his goal, and now he's on his second or third stretch goal, which is they just hit $10,000, which means two issues of Blitz can be published. And cool. his, I think his ultimate goal is like 20K, and then he can do all four issues. And and I'll have because it's going to be quarterly. Then I'll have an entire year's worth. Okay, that sounds perfect. Yeah, because okay. I've been really because right now we're in a really weird spot where I feel like the only thing that really gets tr like like basically a Kickstarter or previews is the only way to really advertise books. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, unless like like having YouTube really helps. You know, like I, yeah, I do yeah, definitely. Yeah. Guys really crack the code on on that. Um, yeah, so it, yeah, it is just, just talking to us. You have two new readers. Just exactly. so you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but if we get enough of us to do this, that two can quickly become ten, right? Right? Yeah. yeah I mean, that's the cool thing about doing kind of smaller press indie comics too. Is like you get people that are just will follow you and are excited about your work, and if you take risks, they're willing to be like, "Oh, well, this comic sound like the new thing I'm working on." It's like. For a video game company, which already sounds bad, and then the characters have no faces. They're all like clay people, no faces. <laughs> and, and just that I've got goodwill with people that were like, they're like, oh, I liked his other work. Let's try this out. I feel like that's really like what it all comes from, like, like the whole surviving in comics. Yeah, and I think it's like we spend a lot of time giving out like, f like free information, free lessons, free entertainment. It, it builds a community of, of people who like you, you earn the trust in people. And, and then when you go to produce something, they're, they're very, they're a lot more invested in, in what you're doing in that realm too. And I think that, I mean, getting back to something you said earlier, um, not just the publishers, but social media, like everything had just become so focused on everyone fighting for attention and negativity. It's, it's nice to step aside from that and kind of be like, all right, that that's a community. Like they can go have that. Yeah. What we can do over here is make something that is focused on all the things, why we got into this, like what we love craft comics, yeah. having fun, um, no negative shit teaching. Like, like when I was a kid coming up, I would have killed to been able to watch like comic book artists, showing how things are done. Totally. I mean, do you remember like being little, like trying, like I remember the first time I heard people inked with a brush. I was like, wait, 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 what, what, what kind <laughs> of brush? How, how do you do that? Cause I was doing everything. I, I was doing everything in pencil when I was a kid. And then I yeah. read a, uh, a Ben Dunn Ninja high school thing. Uh, he has a good YouTube channel too, by the way. Uh, okay. but ben <laughs> the, uh, like, like it was just like a lot of my early instructional stuff was all from uh, Antarctic Press. They would put out things on like how comics are done, and it was super useful. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Well, I to mean, these days, Mateo. Sorry. Did you have more access to to uh, to kind of how comics are made than than mm, a sturdy? No, but in Italy, if you're interested in being a comic book artist, you have a lot of options once you get out of uh, high school. Okay. Because there's a lot of like there's a lot a lot of uh, schools for comic books. Like to this day, I think there there might be like at least fifteen or so. Oh wow! Wow. So. You probably don't have, you know, you probably don't have uh, a specific magazine or something that talks about it, 
but for sure you're and, and and the way they're structured most of them they're like it's not every day so by having this structure and and uh it's just a few hours on specific days okay so with the structures I'll, the structures allow, allows the schools to hire actually like working professionals because sometimes you have to you know maybe you have you only have a class on Tuesday for three hours so actually you know working professionals they can become teachers while for example the school that I did it was Monday through Friday uh, five hours every day or six hours every day and uh and by doing that like the professors the teachers were actually only teachers they were great teachers don't get me wrong but they were not working so they would teach you a lot of theory mm -hmm. and a lot of technical stuff but when it came to explain to you how the italian industry works or the us industry works you know they didn't really know so what they would do sometimes they they invite some ex students of them they that were working for example there's ex student of mine is working now in france has been working for the over the past four years is coming here and tell you how the french industry works for example. oh nice mm -hmm. so and, yeah yeah and, and not only that like having a professor having a teacher that works in the industry if you're a really good student they might you know take you with them to uh, show a new to the New York Comic Con once, and and that happens. Like sometimes you see some of the teachers of the sure. schools they 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 bring the students to American shows, the ones that are interested in in the U.S. industry, for example. It's really cool. We're, so we're so yeah, we have a lot of that. Were Menara and Pratt like really big deals when you were when you were that age, or is that more like an American perception? Uh, no, they they were big deals. Like since the probably the out. I would say the 80s. I don't want to say something yeah. stupid, but for sure since the 80s. And they're they're really they're considered to be really big. Sure. Uh, I feel like that's well. like Italy is like Kirby and Miller. Was that sorry? Italy is like, like that's like Italy is like Jack Kirby and Frank Miller, like Pratt and Minara. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely yeah, I mean definitely. I don't know if you heard Brandon, but Matteo um when he was trying to break in uh was about to like stop like he was he had just gotten discouraged and he had entered in a at a comic con in a in a talent competition and the judge was topi is that right mateo yeah oh, yep. nice. and so mateo won and he gets a call from topi telling him he won and that was like what kept him in i'll do so, it that's a that's a pretty cool story Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I still uh, have a really fond memory of that moment. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, as as I would hope. Um, awesome. But we're we're we've done about an hour. But I did want to like we don't have to go into deep deep detail about it because you've obviously recorded with Brett going on and on about it. But I did want to address like some cancel culture stuff because because yeah. you've been through it a little bit. You've seen it from from the other side and uh, I'm just curious your thoughts on it and, and how it affected you and, and what, what went on and yeah. how your comic that you're doing now addresses it. I mean, there's a lot to unpack, but I mean, as, I mean essentially it's like, uh, you know, kind of how we're talking about like this community that exists now, almost like a third party that's craft based and positivity. I think there's also communities that are essentially like, like, unfortunately, I think the online comics communities, there's there's groups of people that I don't want to totally demonize, but I feel like they exist to scold and try to get people in trouble. You know? oh, and, yeah, I feel like I feel like like social media has done some weird and damaging things to human beings, one yeah. of which is it's about getting attention and that attention is something you can capitalize and monetize. So if you, if, and the easiest means to getting attention is to be negative. So if you can become someone who gets attention by, by attacking someone and, and kind of that's your brand in a sense, people are building careers off of that and yeah, ruining people's lives and doing so. Cause the person who made me a project was the same person who went after Craig. 
So it, it does start to think like, oh, oh that's your thing. You just try to find people and try to destroy their reputation. Right. And and I and with Ed too, some of the people went after Ed have gone after Warren Ellis. And it's like, yeah, you do right. see the same names. And they do have a sense of entitlement to to them as like, I'm leading the charge, as if they're they're leading a social cause, but they're they're really creating a social cause in, in some yeah. way. Yeah. And there's a weird there's a weird assumption um yeah, I mean, it's it's really caused me to kind of think about humans differently than than before because because I feel like you can be like there's someone who you're like there's an artist I like they seem they seem cool I like their work and then someone you've never heard of can be like actually they're a shitty person and you can be like I've followed their work for ten years you know what fuck them they're a shitty person yeah and you're yeah, like yeah. why are we believing just like any stranger in my situation with the That's- Cause like ahead, I didn't have an individual that was like, he's a shitty person. I had this like vague amorphous rumor. He's a shitty person. And it's like, and I know the kind of ins and outs of it after five years of where it was coming from and everything, but, but it, it was crazy how much it affected my career and my, like, like I, I lost so many friends that were just like, I talked to someone over a DM for three minutes. Uh, it doesn't matter. I've known you for five years. You're dead to me. And it's just like, what the fuck is going on? You know? Yeah. And yeah. It's strange. I think I'm at a place now that I can kind of look back at, but like it almost ruined comics for me. And, and I feel like, you know, and I've dealt You're with not stuff. alone. Yeah. You're not. Okay. Craig said the same thing. Craig is still, Craig is still like uncertain of, of like coming back to it. He's got, I mean, he's obviously yeah. finished with ginseng roots, but uh, it, it's affected him in, in the same way where it's, he's like, I, I might just be done with this now. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I understand, I've talked to him a lot about it because, you know, it is like, and it's gotten kind of ridiculous because there's a point where like, you know, like even my interaction with Ed, like if there's someone I know and I see them kind of get in trouble, I reach out to them always. I'm always like, Oh, well, and it's, it's gotten kind of cartoonish where I'm like, here's the steps you take. Now you get a therapist, you get offline, you do all this stuff. And it's like, it's, it's really disheartened to me. It's like, this is supposed to be a community of people who, and, and I should qualify. It's also different now. Like post Ed, hopefully we're seeing the end of it. I hope so. I hope so. I imagine people just put up with it much less. But it is, it is really surreal how um, crazy it can get over so little. Yeah. Uh, there's there's an effect that happens too. Like if you're an, if you're an expert on something, uh, and you know, if, like if you're a huge Batman fan, and the news does a story about Batman, and like. They're like they get everything wrong, you know. They'll be like Batman who based his right. costume off a mouse or whatever. And you're like, you've never read it. <laughs> and then the next story that happens, they'll be like, you know, uh, this, you know, uh, this other thing happened, and you're immediately like, well, that I believe because I don't know anything about it. Right, right, yeah. It's yeah. dude. That's yeah, a but- strange thing about social media. I, I uh, there was a rapper who posted something the other day, and and. I had to unfollow him. I'm just like, people see a video on Instagram and they just buy it. They just believe it. And they just buy it. One of my favorite accounts I follow is this like legit nutritionist who all she does is take these reels that, that people who are not nutritionists, but are selling a nutrition product make and all these claims they make, like eating oranges will destroy the, your body your gut bacteria, like just weird shit like that. Like this is the key to being skinny and, and she'll just call them out on each video. And I feel like that's what we need. We need, we need to get back to this idea that there are experts and we can trust them. But just cause I saw it on Instagram doesn't make it real. Like it just blows my mind how quick people just believe it. Yeah. The stuff with Ed did is it really showed how the online comics, news sites on a, on a large scale, a lot of them are working against comics is my impression. You yeah. know, like it, it's, it's kind of surreal. It's like, it's like you don't hear about good, exciting books to them. You hear about like, Oh, an artist you love, someone's mad at them. And you're like, that doesn't help right. anyone. No. Yeah. It's, I, I don't know. It's, it's a lot, I don't want to rant too much and it's a lot to unpack, but it's a, it's a really, it was a really insane thing to go through. And the fact that, and, and I don't think it's just comics, but I think comics has dealt with it in worse ways than any other community that I'm aware of, you know, yeah, because like, so. you know, we lost someone and people like, 
like just that like Craig is thinking about leaving comics because what? Because someone whose comics no one's ever read decided that his comics were offensive, but you know, yeah, a bunch of people bought them and enjoyed them. Yeah. Well, dude. And what's crazy is when, I mean, it's not out yet, but on Craig's episode, uh, he released to BB and immediately went on a middle East tour, like through Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and a few other countries where he was celebrated for Habibi. Yeah. And it wasn't until he came back to the United States where the New York Times trashed it and attacked him and everyone came at him. And it was like, wait, the the Middle East had no problem with this. Why why why, why is this a problem? Like it's insane. Yeah, I mean, it's I think mind it's really American and it's 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 you know, I think it happens a bit in Europe because I know um I know some stuff happened with uh, that Petit Paul book in Angoulême a couple years ago. That sounds uh, familiar. Oh, uh, yeah. Is that Bastien the one by Bastien Vives? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. There's another, like, like, he's like, you know, he's like Craig Thompson level, I think, as far as ability. And just, yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard for me not to, like, like, there's so many guys. You get, like, Frank Miller and Robert Crumb and, you know, Bastien Vives and, and Craig Thompson, where I'm like, these are all kind of rare creative talents that I feel like we should, um, we should be protecting more from crazy people on the internet, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And protecting more with the truth. I mean, that that's the, th like we, we're not asking anyone to protect a lie or, or protect someone who's done awful things. Like we're just trying right. to protect, protect with truth. Like, let's contextualize yeah. this. And it does get really messy, but I, I have to always go with the idea of, like, like comic book community is not set up to be a uh, court system. And, you know, and, and something that's really affecting me a lot is my, uh, you know, my girlfriend, Casey, was working as a defense attorney when we started dating. Mm -hmm. and, and it really made me realize, like, like, there is, like, real ways to deal with this stuff. As broken as, you know, as... as, as it, as much as it doesn't work, the judicial system in America, just there needs to be something like that. And the comic industry is just not set up to adjudicate crimes. Mm -mm. You know, it could be a thing where, oh, this guy went to prison. Maybe we shouldn't hire him for Aquaman. But it's, right. it's really weird when it's like this person that's, you know, because in comics so much of it, it's like this person that's never met this person is mad at them we need to drop their book. And on a certain level, it's just like, that's none of our business. Like that, like if that, that, that's a, that, those words are the answer to everything. Like when the Ed thing first started happening, I was just like, this is none of our business. Like this has nothing to do. Like none, all these people like, like online, like condemning him. I'm like this, how entitled of you to think this, like if Ed would just come out and apologize, it's like, wait a minute, who are you? Right. Why does he owe you an apology? This has nothing to do with you. I feel like worst case scenario, it's a conversation where your friends be like, "Hey, dude, get your get yeah. your stuff in order if you're doing something wrong." But it, but putting it on your job seems really unethical of people because everyone has the right to make a living, and if somebody yeah. has doing things that are socially bad, then hopefully that's where community comes in and you can work with someone. Right. If things get crazy and somebody is like really doing something where they're hurting people, then that's where the law comes in. You know, and it, it right, can't, right. Like, it can't be like this person's got a zine about Steven Universe. Let's have them <laughs> decide. You know, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think that, and I've already spoke about it when we were talking about Greg, the whole Greg thing. Like, I think that companies also have a responsibility in this because you have to be able, even in this weird moments when something happens and something comes out you need to have the ability to be rational at the time because at the end of the day if you look at the numbers like and this is everywhere you can find it everywhere the people that actually write bright comments and stuff like that is just a one percent of the total people on social media sure right? right and you're giving like if we if there was a country and the one percent wanted a law to be, you know, promoted or mm -hmm. done, it you wouldn't do it. You would just say, "No, fuck you. We're not doing it." There's yeah. too not not enough of you in order right. to make this matter important, you know. Right. And 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 sometimes 
they're the most of the time they're the loudest ones. So mm -hmm. it looks like a lot of voices, but actually it's not the you know voice of the people. That's you know so to speak. Yeah, and, uh, and yeah. There's a friend of mine who's uh, uh, my friend Wyatt who writes this comic called Knights Over Damage. Um, he reads his reviews too much, and I always tell him not to. No, oh, like, man. I'm always like, I I was like. If I didn't work in comics, there's no way I would read a comic and not like it and be like, I need to write an article about this. Like, you, that's either your job or you're a crazy person, you know? Right. It's, well, and most people who are getting paid to do it are crazy people now. <laughs> yeah, there's elements of that, too. I mean, we good critics are great. Like, they're rare and great. And I, I am probably improved some of my work by, by when I used to read reviews of my stuff. There being good reviews of it. But... Uh, I always think there is that way that people review books where they have like a stack. It's like, I got all the new X-Men books and then I have your personal diary comic book about your mother's death. And I'm just going to skim through them all in an afternoon. <laughs> Four stars, three stars, two stars, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. It's sick. It's just, it's a very weird industry, but, uh, uh, the, the art form I think is worth it. Yeah. The medium's worth it. Oh, and yeah. We're building it. I do yeah, think definitely. we're building a new industry now with, yeah. with everything we're, we're doing also and i know we're running super late but i i wanted to add something about you know the you know the indie comic books that are you know rising up and stuff like that i, I there's a really interesting uh uh podcast episode that i talked about in the millar episode mm -hmm. and it's the one on millar time millar's podcast he invited uh, three uh, comic book retailer to discuss the industry, like talking about numbers, stats, what happens when you do this, and 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 you know, and they were trying to come up with solutions. Okay. And one thing that I never, I, I would have never even imagined that if they didn't tell it, if they didn't say it out loud, is that. Usually when you have a healthy mainstream, that affects positively the indie scene as well. Sure. Because when you have a healthy mainstream, that brings people to the to the shops. And then that's where the retailer comes up and is like, oh, if you like this, you might like this thing, which is an indie book, but it might be, you know, similar to the stuff that you like since I see that you like this and this and that. So I don't know. I've never thought about it. And, and, and it's, um, I don't know. It's, it's really, it's a really interesting thing, uh, to me. Yeah. And, and that's what Ramon's blitz is kind of aiming to do. It's like you came in, you bought, you know, the Spider-Man, the X-Men, the Batman, here's a free magazine about what's going on in the indie creator scene yeah. and about the craft of comics. Yeah. And so smart. the hope is like, then people are like, Oh, let me, let me try this. Let me go check this out. We're in a really weird point right now with with mainstream stuff too, because I th I feel like the movies. I, I probably said this a million times, and it's probably been said by a million other people. But the movies are now the real superhero comics. Yes, and yes. the reputation of Marvel and DC <clears throat> right now is not interesting. Like it's not like they're no. doing like it's not like the movies are crazy. Check out how crazy the comics are. Because right, right. There's such a cottage industry of complaint around it that like if you put out a good book. It's like a good Marvel book right now. I feel like no one will talk about it because they're looking to be offended, you know? Yeah, well, that, that's yeah. true too. But I also think like the, the movies, like they're, they're giving the publishers, like the business people behind the publishers, the wrong idea of, of what we do. Like sure. I saw like, like AWA just put out a, a, a Ronda Rousey Kickstarter for a graphic novel and and I'm just like, that's, that's the wrong, we got to stop like trying to capitalize on like a celebrity name to sell a book. Like that, I, I, I don't think a, it sells. I don't think it does anyone any favors. Cause in the end, is it, is it going to be like a great comic or, or, uh, or should we be looking for like the next Frank Miller? I guess I mean, with the, voice? hopefully that stuff can be good. I always think about when Kyle Baker did the Howard, the duck comic adaption and it was better than the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, Kyle, ba but uh, that was Kyle Baker. Yeah, that was Kyle Baker. But but I my hope with all this stuff, like you know, like I haven't read the Keanu Reeves book that sold a lot, but yeah, I'm curious about that. Yeah, I'm my hope is that the stuff. But even in that, even in that, you had Matt Kent writing it. Sure. Like, yeah. 
Well, also they're being consistent with it. Like I recently done a cover for a new version that uh, Jason Heron is writing, settle in the, uh, how do you call it? Uh, Old Wild West, basically. Was that your Death Dealer homage cover? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that was crazy. So it's basically Berserker, but in in a different, you know, timeline. So they're kind of trying to expand on it. I don't know that yeah. I, I, as you guys, I, I don't know. I haven't read the, the actual books. Yeah, so we should. I don't it. know. But they have Ron Garney on art. Like, yeah, this, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. a fucking brilliant artist. So, yeah, you know, the yeah. team is there, like, at least. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I just read a good Matt Kent book. Uh, Feral Dowerpool, an friend, old friend of mine, did an did a issue of Mind Management that I really enjoyed. Oh yeah, I love oh, yeah. Farrell. a dude. Farrell's he's a, great. Yeah, he's an amazing artist. Yeah, an amazing cartoonist. Um, yeah. So there's there's hope. Like, but yeah, it's weird because the kind of like we can't control the top of comics. So I feel like we can just work on on our stuff because it does get really frustrating because there's so many like um, yeah. There's hope that like Marvel and DC will do, and I, I do have more hope for for DC because they I, part of it is I the the Catwoman series uh, that came out a couple years ago was like the last superhero comic I remember really enjoying. Which series was that? Um, uh, Ernie Chan, I think. Remember his name right? Oh. The guy that worked on Wonder Woman with Azarello for a while. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know this. Oh, series. Cliff Chang. Cliff Chang. Chang. Oh, Cliff. Yeah. Cliff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Butchering his name on here, but yeah, his work's fantastic, and he did the a great. Oh yeah, he's amazing. Catwoman. Yeah, Cliff's great. Cliff's great. Um, yeah, I saw that part of the Jason Aaron uh, relaunch of Ninja Turtles. He had one of it. I couldn't even imagine what that issue looks like, so I got to track that down at some point. Yeah, I'm kidding. Mateo did a cover for for for, for the turtles, and yeah. it was it was yeah. very micromanaged. So I don't know what the books are like. Raphael drew yeah. the interiors on one of them too. Yeah, Raphael yeah, Albuquerque. Yeah. Oh, cool. absolutely. Huh. I should check some of those out. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah so I don't know. I don't know if it was micromanaged by the license holders too much or not. I, I don't know. Yeah. But Mateo's I experience. James Stoko did a great Godzilla. You know, Godzilla oh, yeah, he did. Century War. Yeah, he did. And yeah. I remember I did a cover for that. And uh, I remember them being really specific about how Godzilla was drawn. Um, but yeah. then the stuff that Stoko was able to do in that book was so, like, I, I feel like that's, I mean, I'm very biased because I'm friends with the guy, but I, I feel like that's, like, one of the best comic adaptions of outside media I've ever read. Yeah, uh, that, yeah oh, really? that was, that was awesome. So that hopefully they're awesome. doing stuff with it. So yeah, it's, it's weird. It's a weird thing to pin it on. Cause like you hope that like people in Ninja Turtles is a weird one too. Cause I, I feel like I'm not happy with Ninja Turtles when they're teenagers, like because they were teenagers yeah. when I was 14. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's the, there's the kind of dark Knight version that Eastman did. Uh, yeah. Last Ronin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So maybe if yeah, that was, which I gotta read. I want. I want to read that one. That one looked it's, good. It's really. It's. It's really like a Frank Miller fanzine. It's really. It's fun in that way. Sounds mm-hmm. fun. All right. So we've gone. We've gone a while. We could keep going, but let's let's cap it off here, and uh, and we can have Brandon back another day because I think we have oh, a lot yeah, more absolutely. we can talk about. I, it was a lovely conversation, man. Yeah, it was a, yeah. a pleasure. Thank you for coming on, Brandon. Really, yeah, thanks a lot, man. And when when is your uh, your uh, bio comic your autobio comic coming out your diary comic? Oh, it comes September, out in- right? Yeah. Are you gonna uh, kickstart it or or it's coming out but with a publisher? Uh, this one we're just doing through because I've been working with this publisher called Living the Line, and we were doing a bunch mm-hmm. of kickstarters for uh, the Moonray books I was doing with them. And this one we're just gonna we're just trying out like what happens if we just push it through Diamond and retailers and see see how it does. I'm trying to. Right, the baseline is working with this publisher and kind of what I can expect sales wise for each, each book. And this one okay. was cool. Cause it was like, it was done and I didn't really have to, like, I didn't, I didn't really have to pay my rent off of this book. So it's all, it can be kind of a test book. Oh, that's Do you great. have a specific date? Like September, is there a number? Yeah, I think it's or... September. Let's see, I got a preview around here somewhere. It's the middle of September. That's awesome. Like basically <laughs> when this episode comes out, it might be around that time, actually. Might be around the time, probably a couple can, of weeks uh, before it comes out. So people, you know, go out and buy it. I got too many books around here. But I had a copy. The new, it's on the inside. There's an ad for it on the inside front cover of last month's previews. I can tell you when this episode comes out because 
This one will be out in, uh, September 16, so right in the middle of September. Might, oh, yeah, it should might be, be That's probably yeah, the week. Might that. be perfect. Yeah, it sounds awesome. perfect. All right, thanks again, B. Yeah, thanks, thanks man. All right, Mateo. Yeah, likewise. Now that we have – guys, we have a new – hold on, hold on, hold on. We have a new GIF of this. Oh, yeah, so the GIF. That who, who did I, that? Uh, Jamie, so I got – I had oh, a okay, comment okay. – I had a comment on Twitter of someone saying, I wish I had a gif of Mateo saying bye-bye. So I just asked Jamie, like, how easy would that be to make? Like five minutes later, he just sends me the gif. So guys, I'm going to be using it. I'm probably going to put out in my newsletter a link to download it. So let's all start using the Mateo gif. Mateo, (laughs) sign, sign, sign us off. Sean, you ready for this pre-launch? Is is that like a sexual thing? What? No, 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 no. The, the pre-launch page for my Kickstarter book called Defective Comics Presents Savage Street Vigilante. Yeah, I'm, I'm really ready for that, yeah. Okay, cool, because people can hit the link below Sign up to follow the pre-launch page, and then the whole campaign kicks off on October 1st to actually purchase the book, and it's going to be wild, man. I'm excited. Sexually excited? Yes. I think the people are going to get pretty horny about this. (laughs) 